So, what is the most complex thing on Earth? The question calls to mind supercomputers or biotechnologies or nuclear fusion test sites, and none of those answers are half bad, but they've all got nothing on the real answer. Zooming in, we might think about intricate chemical compounds, or zooming out, we might consider the idea of ecology or a biome, but that is still not it. No, the most complex thing on Earth is something that, in a manner of speaking, is very much man-made, and it's so ubiquitous, so common in our society, that we feel very confident in saying that everybody's got one, and it's sitting right in between your ears as we speak. With somewhere around a hundred billion neurons and hundreds of trillions of connections between them, the human brain is a more complex structure than even a galaxy. And it is profoundly ironic that the thing in the entire universe that is the most central to us, and in fact is the thing that is us, is perhaps the thing that we are furthest away from being able to fully understand. But around the world, neuroscientists are hard at work trying to change that, trying to create the holy grail of not just psychology, not just of medicine, but of humanity itself, a connectome, a comprehensive map of every neuron cell and every synapse connection in a human brain. It is an impossibly complex task, a feat of advanced scientific inquiry so mind-blowing as to be nearly incomprehensible. But if it can be done, it's going to revolutionize the very nature of what it means to be human. The concept of a connectome first arose in the early 2000s, inspired by the similarly Herculean effort of building a human genome, a full, complete understanding of a person's genetic code. In 2005, two unaffiliated researchers came to basically the same conclusion, at basically the same time, that if researchers could map out a human brain in its entirety, then they might be finally able to understand it. In his doctoral thesis at Lausanne University Hospital, Dr. Patrick Hagman argued that the entirety of a human brain can work together to do more than its individual neurons neurons would indicate, and in order to understand the brain's capabilities, you have to understand the entire system as it works within itself. In a paper published at about the same time, a research team led by Indiana University's Olaf Sporn suggested that by building a connectome model, neuroscientists could far better understand what's going on in the brain, why it's going on, and how structural changes to the brain itself directly affect a person's brain function. Now, we're not going to try and be any more heady with these concepts concepts that we need to, so if you're familiar with the neuroscience of all of this, please do feel free to expand on what we're explaining in the comments below. We're gonna keep it for the layman here. So let's start with some of the basics that should help us understand this entire concept. The human brain, at its most basic level, is made up of cells that are called neurons, and their primary job is to transmit information. They do this by transmitting electrical charges down an individual neuron itself, first by triggering and generating electrical charge in the cell body and then running down a long stretched out section to the end of the cell which we're going to talk about in a moment now neurons similar to computer code they operate on a binary system their electrical pulses only have one intensity and they only come one at a time and there isn't any actual data that's being transmitted inside them there is either an electrical pulse or there isn't the presence of the pulse has meaning as one half of the binary options the lack of the pulse of course being the other option now this should rightfully seem like a pretty way of running a brain until that is, remember that these neurons are meant to communicate. After an electrical pulse runs down a neuron and gets to the ends, that pulse is transmitted to the neurons around it, who receive that binary information, often from a few or a dozen or a hundred different neurons at once, and then they use that information to decide whether to release their own pulse. It's in this way that individual binary neurons, all working together, are able to transmit complex information. Certain parts of the brain, individual neurons might work together in the millions to construct a representation of your entire visual field. In other parts, they might process your sensory experiences or relay instructions to your body on how to move or breathe or make your heart beat. Other sections control complex thought, emotion, decision making, but all of them, no matter how detailed or frankly just incredible as they might be, they're nonetheless grounded in that binary system. A neuron fires or it does not. So by now, it should be fairly obvious that the brain is more than just the sum of its parts. If you take the hundred billion neurons that your brain is using to process this video and hold them in your hands, you're just going to be holding a lot of pink slimy goo that doesn't really do anything. You'd also be dead, but that's a little bit beside the point. But the point is, your brain is somehow able to take all of those binary signals all flashing around in a mess of pink slimy goo and make it into your perceptions, your actions, your emotions, and just a whole lot more. 
Modern neuroscience has struggled to quantify how exactly that happens. Now, we know some things. For example, you can take a person with perfectly functional eyes and render them blind by cutting their optic nerve, a bundle of neurons that transmits information to the brain without you haven't damaged their eyes at all. Or even if you don't know what's happening inside your brain to trigger depression, you know that whatever is happening can be blunted with a dose of antidepressants. But the researchers working on the human connectome, they want to go deeper, much deeper, with a core hypothesis that by understanding what's happening in the entire network of a brain, by observing not just individual neurons, but the way they all interact and communicate, they can understand how simple physiology becomes behavior or perception or feeling. If everything you feel, everything that you think is accompanied by a process in the brain that allows that feeling or thinking to happen, then mapping those processes is functionally the same as mapping you. The implications of such a breakthrough are beyond that of the printing press, beyond that of penicillin, beyond that of possibly even nuclear fusion, really on par with fire or the invention of the wheel. Taken to its fullest implications, a complete connectome for a human brain would reveal what exactly has caused, say, that brain's depression or its anxiety or its schizophrenia. It would show with incredible clarity the processes that lead to confusion and to bias, to love and to hate. It would chart the earliest moments of neurological decay, lay bare every step of development that goes right or wrong. And the theory goes it would show the path to make all those things better, revealing the cures for an ailment no less complex than the human condition itself. Making a map. As we discuss how exactly to build a connectome, we first got to begin with one simple reality. As of right now, humanity does not have the means to build a human connectome, not for one single solitary brain. That said, it's as important to imagine ways of getting there now as it was to imagine ways to reach the moon before we could do it. The first ever connectome that humans created was for a humble roundworm known as C. elegans, which was mapped out and finalized in 1992. Now, all love to the roundworm, of course, but it was a particularly good starting point for such a massive initiative, mostly because the roundworm is not very bright. It's got roughly 300 neurons to its name, a small brain if we've ever seen one, and about 7,000 points of connection between them. But just the effort to analyze the roundworm's brain took 12 entire years. Every neuron had to be catalogued. And since this research took place before any of the cutting edge technologies of today, it was done using electron microscopes and manual visual recognition. Obviously, this kind of methodology can't really be scaled to humans. Not only is the human brain 11 orders of magnitude more complex, but the world literally does not have enough electron microscopes to support such an effort, at least if we wanted it to end during our lifetimes. The real potential for a breakthrough, at least right now seems to be at a macro scale, where diffusion-weighted MRI and functional MRI technology can non-invasively allow us to see inside a brain. Diffusion-weighted MRI can be used to observe bundles of neurons in the brain. It's nowhere near being able to pick them out individually, but it can at least show where the major pathways are. It's a map that'll show you freeways and major roads while leaving out neighborhood cul-de-sacs. Functional MRIs allow researchers to see activity within those same networks, observing which parts Parts of the brain are talking to each other and where and when certain bits of information are transmitted. But these MRI tools don't allow researchers to do the real work of mapping the connectome, really getting down to the neuron by neuron level. That work happens at the micro scale, where distances and lengths are counted in micrometers rather than millimeters. At present, it's only possible to do this after an organism has died by taking its brain apart and analyzing neural tissue directly. Neurons can be stained and traced within a slice of brain using a light microscope. And by taking enough slices of brain all next to each other, scientists can reconstruct bits of that brain tissue complete with the connections between individual cells. It's a slow process, but one that can work if given enough time and careful attention. But even as we discuss how a connectome might be built, we've got to take into account the ways in which it remains, at least for now, frustratingly unfeasible. Not only would the simple data collection for this sort of thing take 
take an unbelievably long time, as we've already mentioned, but at present, the digital tools that we'd need to map this data out are nowhere near as advanced as they'd need to be in order to reconstruct the connectome map once we have it. And then there's another layer of problems. Even if neuroscientists were to produce a full interactive connectome simulation where they could, for example, introduce a stimulus and see how the connectome reacts, they'd have no way to actually make sense of the data they'd be getting back. Part of not knowing how exactly human neural function works is not knowing what, say, the experience of joy or fear would even look like. Making sense of the data that comes out of the connectome, that's another matter entirely. There's some efforts underway to address this problem now, but all are in their infancy with no real indication of whether or not they're actually ever going to work in practice. The connectome and the real world. Luckily for neuropsychology nerds everywhere, the size and scale of the human connectome hasn't completely discouraged neuroscientists from trying to map it, and the most patient among their number have actually achieved quite a bit of success. In March of 2023, a research team at the University of Cambridge, led by Marta Zlatic, successfully mapped the connectome of a larval fruit fly in its entirety. Now, the fruit fly, still not particularly intelligent, but it's a hell of a lot smarter than a roundworm, and it's got the brain to show for it. The fruit fly in question was the proud owner of 3,000 1,016 neurons and 548,000 synapses, over half a million individual connections. Put it another way, it's over 78 times more complex than the roundworm, which had taken 12 years to map out. This team did it in just five years. The Cambridge team revealed a rich and deeply interconnected brain, one in which the vast majority of individual neurons were receiving multiple sensory inputs at a given time. They were able to use an algorithm to predict the flow of signals through the brain's neural network, and they could see the direct pathways from sensory input to motor output. And even though the brain of a larval fruit fly doesn't come close to the language, thought, or sensorimotor power of the human brain, we're still discussing a life form where some 60% of its DNA is shared with humans. And the basic principles of neural organization at work in people are similar enough in the fruit fly to be a valuable guide for future studies. In the last few years, other connectomes have been completed too. A sea squirt and a marine worm have both had their brains fully modeled and an incomplete connectome of an adult fruit fly with 25,000 neurons and 20 million connections mapped out is perhaps an even more important advancement in terms of the sheer number of connections it has modeled. The so-called Mouse Connectome Project out of the University of Southern California is well on its way to imaging, you guessed it, the connectome of a mouse and partial connectomes for a mouse's primary visual cortex and retina are publicly available today. Similar efforts in mice are underway at Seattle's Allen Institute, where researchers hope to map out a cubic millimeter of a mouse's cortex. And if that doesn't sound too difficult, well, think again. That cubic millimeter contains 100,000 neurons, a billion connections, and four kilometers of neurons. And that's only a five hundredth of what's inside an entire mouse's brain. That single data set comprised two petabytes of data, two million gigabytes, meaning that if the entire mouse brain was mapped, the world's most powerful supercomputer could hold only a tiny fraction of the network. There's good reason to believe that the human connectome may come more more and more within reach sooner than researchers have previously thought. Although the technology isn't there yet to make a full human connectome, it's clearly getting better every day. Software can trace neurons today in a small fraction of the time that it would take humans to, and the newest microscopes can image far faster and far more accurately than previous generations. Mathematical modeling, network mapping, and AI are all incredibly valuable in their own way, and as these technologies are more and more directly worked into connectome research, they may exponentially decrease the time and manpower needed to take on the human brain. Several human connectome research organizations are hard at work laying the groundwork for this technology to arrive. For example, the Human Connectome Project is conducting macro-scale imaging of human brain circuits using the MRI-based methods that we discussed a moment ago in large populations of people. And while this research doesn't take place at the neuron level, it should streamline the entire process or once sufficient neuron-level imaging becomes available. But for all the starry-eyed conjecture on just how soon a human connectome might come to reach, we've also got to lay out some of the expert skepticism that's out there. While the vast majority of neuroscientists would agree that it would certainly be nice to have a working human connectome, many believe that it simply isn't worth wasting time and resources on right now. Most of the theory on how to build a connectome has already been worked out, and there's only so much value in testing more theories on less sophisticated brains over and over again. 
At a certain point, experimentation may just be throwing away research hours and grand dollars, but if there's not yet ample technology to do the work neuroscientists really want to be doing, why are we bothering at all? Experts in the field also are quick to point out that even if an entire human brain could be analyzed and mapped post-mortem, this leaves out a crucial part of how the brain functions in practice. When it's inside a living being, a brain is constantly wiring and rewiring itself through a slow and steady process of neuroplasticity, not growing new neurons, but connecting those neurons to each other in new and different ways. This is the core process that allows people to learn new skills or adapt to new environments. But a dead brain, mapped out post-mortem, has none of that. Thus, there's an entirely fair argument that you can't actually have a connectome until you have a living connectome, analyzed using techniques and technologies that are utterly unknown to us today. A present connectome research is breaking boundaries while simultaneously sitting virtually frozen in time. It's a fantastic scientific feat to go from roundworm to fruit fly to mouse, scaling up neural maps to the point where they contain millions of individual connections, but at the same time, those advancements do very little to bring the human connectome any closer to reality. Until humanity is able to create new and yet unknown methods to study individual neurons in flux throughout the entire brain and put together the sheer processing power to record that data, the human mind will remain fundamentally unknowable. Whether we see such a massive change within our lifetimes, well, we're just gonna have to wait and see, aren't we?